Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of Gooey's Dungeon Dive, the podcast where I, Gooey, rank every dungeon in The Legend of Zelda, and today we're continuing our quest through A Link to the Past. Now that we've made it to the Dark World, our quest, our journey, takes us through the Dark World as we try to free all of the maidens from every dungeon. Our first destination we have marked on our map is the Palace of Darkness. And from the Nintendo Player's Guide, they say, The palace in this region was said to have been the residence of the King of the Golden Land. After Ganon took over, the Hylian King moved out and the Helmosaur King moved in. <laughs> With no upkeep, the garden maze became overgrown and the halls of the palace deteriorated. Monkeys played a big part in the design of the Dark Palace exterior. In addition to the monkey statues, live monkeys were also sighted on grounds. A couple of fun little flourishes there I liked, obviously. Yeah, so there's... that kind of hints us to our two sort of themes here. One is in the overworld, and I guess the other one is the dungeon theme, maybe. So, you know, after some garden maze navigation here... Uh, you'll eventually be followed by a monkey named Kiki, who will continue to follow for 10 rupees, but uh, we'll need him to also open the dungeon entrance, which will cost another, well, it'll cost 100 rupees. So, kind of a lot of money for, for Kiki here, but, um, you know, <laughs> you need him. So, you pay him, he climbs on the entrance and triggers the switch, and it opens up. Uh, it's kind of a. I don't know, neat little thing, and yeah, I guess you've got the monkey statues on the outside, but other than that, that's really all this place has to do with monkeys, but uh, you know, okay, sure. Yeah, thematically, I don't think Palace of Darkness is as tight in that regard. There are elements, I like the idea that it's kind of the residence of the king of the Sacred Realm, because it sort of mirrors, it's in the same location as the Eastern Palace, and um, certain layouts in the dungeon do kind of look like the Eastern Palace, so it's kind of cool because it is in this, you know, sort of mirror world. So, you know, that's kind of interesting, and I like that it's, it's sort of subtle in that regard. It's not, you know, hitting you over the head with that. Most of the themes we'll see here are more just in gameplay and navigation, I think. It's a massive step up, I think, in terms of navigational design from all the previous dungeons. And I think it's amazing. It's a masterclass in this sort of non-linear dungeon design that uh, I love in a lot of Zelda games. This is really like the first dungeon where you'll find multiple keys and have like different options in terms of how you can use them to progress and stuff like that. Um, especially considering if you know what you're doing, you know the layout well, you can avoid having to open every locked door and get all the keys. So like, you know, it's, it's goes sort of back to some elements of Zelda one, but, um, it feels, it's more intentional here and it, it feels like you can feel really clever if you can eventually figure this stuff out, especially on repeated plays it kind of rewards you for that but if you you know if you don't figure that out you sort of feel like like all of it then still feels like it fits together really well as opposed to like Zelda 1 it it does feel a little bit more random so I think they did kind of perfect that here now you can't just look at the navigation and the puzzling with it as just being defined by like how many keys are there how many doors are there what's required, you know. There's also, this dungeon does a good job of, like, using the mechanics and, like, the architecture and, like, features within the dungeon to create some navigational puzzles that I love. Similar to Tower of Hera, there are parts where you have to, like, fall down from one area to reach another, and, you know, memorizing the layout will help you with uh, some of the like switch puzzles there are in the dungeon. They actually lay it out here in the uh, Nintendo Player's Guide. The passages inside the Dark Palace confused explorers even more than the maze on the ground. Many adventurers were confused by the switches, which opened doors and moved blocks up and down. 
In a room on the first floor, there was a crystal switch which could only be triggered by an arrow, the master sword beam, a boomerang, or a bomb. In another room, there was a constant pressure on a switch on the floor. By moving a statue, explorers were able to venture into the next room. So yeah, really, really tricky with all of these types of things that I like. You know, we saw the introduction of crystal switches in Tower of Hera, but this is where we really see the concept explored more. There are parts where you have to use them to move down blocks to clear a particular path, but it'll block another way, and then you have to kind of use your knowledge of the structure of the whole dungeon to sort of get around one of the blocks to get to the path that you just cleared, like kind of loop around and stuff like that. So it, it really pays, you know, going and memorizing like where the paths go. You know, it's not just as simple as... I've solved this one puzzle, I've cleared this one path. It's, okay, I've moved these blocks down, but now I have to go around a different way to get to them. Which I, yeah, I love it. That concept is also applied in, like, the wall bombing here. Um, this is, I think, I think A Link to the Past kind of perfected the wall bombing puzzles. And really, it's, this is kind of, maybe, maybe the last game that really had good wall bombing? Uh, we'll see. I'll reevaluate that further on, but I kind of complained about it a little bit in Zelda 1, and I think A Link to the Past does this really well. Um, you know, the dungeon presents you with many conspicuous chests on ledges near cracked walls that really require you to, like, look at the map, use your navigational skills to get to the other side of the wall so you can bomb it, and re-enter the room from that crack. Uh, there's one in particular that can only be found after going through some warp tiles and another series of rooms, and it can really kind of warp your perception of where you are. You know, it's it's great. It's not just like, oh, I gotta get on that side of the wall, and you just, you know, go down, go right, go up, and you're on the other side. It's like, you have to memorize, like, okay, this, this warp thing takes me to here, and you gotta look at your map and really um, memorize the space. And there is yet another way <laughs> navigation is defined in this dungeon uh and it's what we know now as a classic motif in zelda but we've only seen it like a couple times before in in the series so far uh but now we see it at its strongest so so far and that is of course the dungeon item in particular, this one is the magic hammer. So yeah, you know, throughout the dungeon we're blocked by these weird obstacles called moles uh, that look like a whack-a-mole <laughs> type thing. And we're terrorized by annoying enemies like the Helmosaur and the Terrapins that you can't... Some are harder to kill and some you can't even kill at all. But then after you navigate for a while, you can find the big key and then and that'll lead to the magical hammer. You're able to, like, now clear the obstacles, but you can take on the enemies more easily. It becomes, like, their weakness or required to beat them. You know, it depends on the case. And it's really satisfying to <laughs> kind of, especially, like, the Terrapins, because you can't really hurt them. It's really satisfying once you get that hammer to, like, be able to hit them and, uh, or hit the ground, flip them over. You know, you're like, aha, I can finally take you. <laughs> you know, they've been menacing you, but you can you know, really take them on. And it's also, you know, it shows how the item can be used as, like, a valuable key to spice up the dungeon exploration. Because you you hit a point where it's like, you find the moles and stuff like that, and you can't move forward. But if you go find the hammer, you know, now you have another key, basically. So you, we've got keys, we've got the, the traps and, you know, switches, we've got the big key... And we've got the item, all as like these useful ways of, uh, you know, combining those elements to make for a really interesting non-linear dungeon. So after you tackle all the obstacles and you've been swarmed by all the minions, uh, <laughs> we take on the Helmosaur King as he has moved in to the palace. Uh, this is a really fun bo boss battle, really iconic, I think. Uh, it's a giant dinosaur with a helmet on, as the name sort of implies. And in the first phase, you know, you have to, like, shatter his helmet. And it's, it's cool, you know, the dungeon at this point should have trained you to use the hammer. 
but bombs also work, so I like the options and the flexibility. But uh, after you shatter the helmet, you you know reveal his weak point, and once you do, then you can you know hit that with your sword or arrows again, like flexibility there. And all the while you're doing this, you have to also like be conscious to dodge him, uh, the fireballs that he spits out, which shoot in these like other diagonal directions, and like his tail that like sweeps around and tries to hit you and they all kind of have different areas of the board that they could hurt you on so it's you know it's just like a classic you know dodge the boss exploit his weak point just a really good fun fight so after we defeat the Helmosaur King we free the first maiden you know she gives us a little bit more backstory tells us about the golden land where the Triforce was and Ganon came and wished on it and the world transformed uh He's in here using the Maidens to build up his power so that he can eventually break free and uh, take over the Light World. And, you know, as opposed to him using their power, if you free all of the Maidens, you can use their power against him to uh, break the barrier around Ganon's tower to get in to take him on. Uh, so that's cool. And she marks all the other uh, dungeons on your map for you you can all you know and now you can go in you know whatever different location you want to go so that's pretty cool and uh yeah there we have it we're one dungeon in as you can tell i really enjoyed this dungeon so obviously i'm gonna rank it pretty well um again i think you know you did really have i think hyrule castle gave us the best kind of theme maybe the tower of hera too with like the tower idea that was really cool but Hyrule Castle had that too sort of as well but Palace of Darkness I think just in terms of exploration you know the dungeon item uh the puzzling of getting around and the boss itself and just you know I think the design is just so strong that for me it like easily jumps to the top of the list. I think we're going to see that now from the Dark World dungeons. They're going to be hanging out up top, and Palace of Darkness is obviously uh, a great start. So there we have it. Uh, Hyrule Castle has been unseated. That's my list so far. Thanks to everyone who's been following along. Uh, we're doing pretty good at this point of recording. We're at like 170 subscribers. Just a reminder everyone that once I get to 200, I'm going to do a little tiny bonus video uh and yeah i appreciate everyone who's been getting the word out there and giving me your list and i will see you next week